I'm Francis Durnley, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we report accounts of house-to-house fighting in Donetsk, discuss Zelensky's impromptu tour of key European capitals, and hear extraordinarily candid reflections from Washington's most senior man in Moscow at the time of the full-scale invasion. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. The first duty of my government is security and defence, to make clear our unshakable support of NATO and with our allies towards Ukraine. Keep stand strong. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. It's Thursday, the 10th of October, two years and 234 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today, dialing in from Germany, I'm joined by our Berlin correspondent, James Rothwell, and later from the US, John J. Sullivan, US ambassador to Moscow from 2020 to 2022, and previously the deputy secretary of state. First, however, a summary of military developments in the past 24 hours. Fights are taking place at every building. The situation is unstable. Words there of a Ukrainian military spokesperson describing intense fighting continuing in Turetsk in Donetsk, where outmanned Ukrainian forces are reportedly fending off Russian troops inside that key strategic city. That's also been confirmed by Reuters and others. There is word of street fighting and Moscow's forces completely erasing certain buildings and structures, something that would tally with Russian doctrine thus far, where if a territory can't be easily secured, it is simply destroyed. Though, as we saw with Bakhmut, that can make it easier to defend, though not in all cases. Further accurate information of the situation there is hard to come by, but broadly speaking, any Russian gains in that vicinity or indeed elsewhere across the entire battlefront are modest, with no signs of significant breakthroughs. According to the ISW and others, the Russian military command has likely ordered Russian forces to conduct a relatively high tempo of mechanised assaults to pursue tactical advances before muddy ground conditions begin in the autumn slash fall and that thereby constraining mechanised manoeuvre. Hence the assaults that Dom and Roland have described in recent days. This could be the most major offensive operations we see before the year ends because of that weather component. Elsewhere, Russian missile attacks across Ukraine killed at least eight and injured 34 over the past 24 hours, according to Ukrainian sources, with extensive air raids over Kyiv and oblasts in the centre, south and southeast of the country. Many of those ballistic missiles are believed to have been fired from Crimea, further underscoring Ukrainian defence vulnerabilities of that territory remaining in Moscow's hands. On the subject of that peninsula in the south, we now enter the fourth day of the oil depot burning in Feodosia in occupied Crimea, releasing a huge plume of black smoke that's visible for many miles around. I was looking at some of the photography coming out of there this morning. Another depot inside Russia, near the city of Kharchev in Bryansk, is also ablaze, with Ukraine's general staff claiming the depot was the 67th arsenal of Russia's main missile and artillery directorate, storing weapons delivered by North Korea. Experts believe this was caused by a long-range Ukrainian drone strike, but it is difficult for us to verify that at this stage. In Kursk, Russia, Ukrainian forces continue attacks on the main Ukrainian salient in recent days, especially around Koronevo and northeast Sudza. A Russian mill blogger, just chiming with what I was talking about a moment ago, claimed yesterday that muddy seasonal conditions have already started in that oblast and are constraining manoeuvres for wheeled vehicles. Poor weather would, of course, likely benefit the defenders there, which in a broad strategic sense remain the Ukrainians in Kursk, despite the operations I just described, because they're bedded in, seeking to hold on to that territory for its implications on future negotiations, something James and I will be touching on shortly. On that theme, President Zelensky continues to claim that there is an end in sight for the war, saying, and I quote, in October, November and December, we have a real chance to move things towards peace and lasting stability. The situation on the battlefield creates an opportunity to make this choice, the choice for decisive action to end the war no later 
than in 2025. And as I say, James will be looking more deeply into Zelensky's movements very shortly. Before that, some more analysis of Russia's proposed 2025 budget that includes a 25% increase in defence spending and a 16% reduction in social spending, reflecting, of course, the government's prioritising of military finance. The UK Defence Ministry's intelligence update has emphasised the backdrop of rising inflation, which reached 90% in August, and ongoing economic challenges caused by demand exceeding supply. It is expected that military spending will account for 40% of the federal budget next year, a quite extraordinary figure and not sustainable indefinitely. For those interested in the economic war against Russia, I highly recommend the interview that we all did with Stephanie Barker a couple of weeks ago, where we really get into the fine details of the present situation on the financial and sanctions front. It's interesting to see That again, over the weekend, the head of MI5, which prioritises Britain's domestic security, said that Russia's intelligence agency had been on a mission to generate sustained mayhem, a strong word, on British and European streets, with GIU agents carrying out arson, sabotage and more dangerous actions conducted with increasing recklessness. That would speak again to the time component, which the financial element also plays into. On Iran, too, he had this to say, that 20 Iran-backed plots had been a direct and lethal threat to British citizens and UK residents in recent months. It is interesting to note that former activities of the intelligence services prioritised homegrown terrorist cells, particularly relating to uh, Islamic terror, whilst now, he said, the shift is once again onto malevolent state actors. And that has enormous implications, of course, in terms of the ability for them to operate and the potential effectiveness of those operations were they successful. And just lastly, a small but I think quite significant story. Lithuania has fortified another bridge over the Namonus River on the route from Kaliningrad, Russia. Fortifications there are progressing as planned, with some bridges set to be demolished and tank traps placed on the bridge. It's quite a striking image, one symbolic of the shift that has taken place in Europe. And we'll include a link to it in the show notes. It's one for the textbooks of the future, I think. But now, staying on the issue of Europe and its response to this war, delighted to welcome back on the podcast James Rothwell, dialing in from Germany. James, always a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Where should we start? I think it's probably worth us talking about Zelensky, who's just a few doors down the road. Hello, Francis. That is indeed the case. Mr. Zelensky has been meeting with Keir Starmer in London today in Downing Street. And this is part of a wider European tour in which he's seeking greater military support from the West, specifically on the restrictions or lifting restrictions, I should say, on how Ukraine can use its weapons against Russia. But we believe he's also discussing the Kyiv victory plan. And I'm just going to outline the sort of rough schedule of what Zelensky's movements are going to be over the next few days. And then we'll touch on the plan as well, which is being kept to some extent under fairly tight wraps. But we can discuss that in a moment. So today, Mr. Zelensky's met with Keir Starmer in Downing Street. Mr. Starmer said it was a chance to go through the plan, referring to the victory plan in more detail. And I understand he also met with Mark Rutter, Secretary General of NATO. He's then going to head from there over to Italy and France, staying overnight, I think, uh, in Italy, meeting with the Pope on Friday morning, and then Mr. Zelensky's off to Berlin later on Friday to meet with Chancellor Olaf Scholz. An interesting question here, why this sudden European tour? This, of course, wasn't the plan. The plan actually was that many Western leaders were going to be meeting in Germany over the weekend in Berlin and at the Ramstein base in Germany. And that was to coincide with a major state visit by President Joe Biden to Germany, the first state visit by US president since the 1980s when Reagan uh, was there. Of course, Mr. Biden visits Germany and US presidents visit Germany all the time. But when I say state visit, I mean specifically a moment where the president of Germany hosts uh, the president of the United States. So symbolically, it was an important tour by President Biden, but it was cancelled quite abruptly earlier in the week. And that's because Mr. Biden has got to stay in the United States to deal with the hurricane which has struck Florida. So that tour was cancelled for the 
practical non-Ukraine related reason of hurricane over in the United States. But of course, inevitably, considering that this weekend of diplomacy was about was supposed to be about a big show of support with Mr. Biden at the helm, non-war related reasons have slightly undermined that. And so the state visit in Germany has been replaced with this whistle-stop European tour around various EU capitals instead. Now, let's talk a little bit about the key victory plan. What's in it? The short answer is that we don't know for sure, but the longer answer is that there have been some details trickling out of various media outlets over the past couple of days, giving us a bit of a clue on on what the victory plan actually is. US officials who've been briefed on the contents of the plan say it has an underlying assumption, this is a Ukrainian vision of victory, it has an underlying assumption that Russia can be fully militarily defeated on the battlefield, that's according to a report in Reuters earlier in the week. But those sources also said to Reuters that it's not so much a big picture plan, it's more of a kind of laundry list of the types of weapons that Ukraine needs going forward in the next few crucial months that Mr. Zelensky spoke about, and you alluded to that uh, earlier in the podcast, and also how they can use those long range weapons and seeking uh, a lifting of restrictions on how Ukraine uses its long range missiles, such as the ability to strike deep into Russian territory. The Financial Times reports that Ukraine ceding bits of its territory to Russia in return for NATO membership may also be something that's being discussed at the moment by Mr. Zelensky and other Western leaders as part of the bigger picture of ending the war. It's worth stressing that the idea of ceding parts of Ukraine to Russia as part of so-called peace negotiations or just a settlement to end the war is something that would be a very painful concept to Ukrainians. The idea that, you know, the bear that's been chewing your leg off since 2022 is going to keep that leg as part of a guarantee that the bear doesn't bite off your other leg. It's it's, it's a painful concept. But according to that report, it's something that that is being discussed. I alluded to that US state visit earlier, which was supposed to happen this weekend, but was cancelled. There's a bit of an open question as to whether that Uh, event has been cancelled or rescheduled. Um, The US election, of course, is just weeks away. It seems difficult to me that Mr. Biden would be able to reschedule that visit to Germany before the election takes place. And it's even more difficult to predict what shape that state visit may take if it's going to happen after the election, of course, depending on the result. So even though Mr. Biden had a good reason to pull out of the Germany state visit, which was the hurricane, the optics of this perhaps are not great. It, It sends a message inadvertently that the leader of the free world is sort of distracted by something that's going on at home at the moment. Um, And for that reason, this sort of hastily organised European tour by Mr Zelensky may not be as impactful as it would have been if it had taken place in the format of a great Joe Biden state visit to Germany and the meeting at Ramstein, which has also been postponed. So those are the key sort of diplomatic developments that we've seen so far. Perhaps there'll be an opportunity to discuss in more detail the victory plan if more details get briefed out to the media over the next uh, couple of days. And maybe we can return to that on a later episode. Well, thank you very much, James. Really interesting to hear those reports there. And I wanted to ask you about the situation between Berlin and Paris at the moment. I was talking about it a little bit last week for a rather tetchy Um, meeting between Scholz and Macron, where they were basically saying their different economic viewpoints of the future of Europe. And of course, you've got the French position, which seeks to be um, far more protectionist, perhaps, if we're to summarise it in a more simplistic way, whilst the Germans want to be far more um, international. And that includes, of course, their dealings with China. So I just wanted to ask where what your perspective was on the current situation and attitude towards China amongst the political elite in Germany. Is it a situation where they're welcoming any and all trade with no caveats at all? Or is there something a little bit more complicated going on, do you think? I think it's worth stressing in any discussion about uh, Germany and its trading relationship with China, that while Germany is kind of guided by a principle of having a very pragmatic 
approach towards China. Uh, it's also increasingly, like many Western countries, very sceptical of its kind of wider global ambitions. The Germans remain very concerned about potential Chinese aggression in Taiwan, and they're always trying to strike this very delicate balancing act between having a sort of pragmatic trading relationship with China and at the same time keeping in, in lockstep, as they often say, with the rest of the West on foreign policy. Uh, there's been quite a big row recently about, um, for, we've, I think we may have talked about this in a previous episode, about the imposition of tariffs on Chinese products. It's a very tricky situation for Germany, which is trying to move into the electric car market. German businesses have been concerned for some time about this risk of cheap Chinese parts sort of flooding the market. At the same time, the German economy has been in a lot of trouble for many years, and that's really starting to rear its head at the moment. When people talk about the German economy in terms of the big picture, uh, the sort of main criticism that's increasingly being levelled at Germany is that it's an economy that has not innovated, particularly on the digital front. It's considered to be an economy that's that's very sort of analogue at a time when other countries are embracing AI, the march of digital technology. The German economy increasingly looks very sort of old fashioned, not just at the macro level in terms of big ambitious projects that are kind of embracing AI, but at the micro level, we are talking about a, a, a country where many businesses still use, uh, for example, fax machines to do a lot of trade even the government is still very reliant on that kind of old school technology. I, I think the most interesting example of this is actually more related to spycraft and trade, which is that the German Chancellor's office still uses a, a, an old school Cold War style pneumatic tube system to deliver messages around the Chancellor's office and other government buildings to prevent the interception of digital messages. And the case could be made that this is as I said, sort of good practice by the Germans in terms of avoiding, as I said, interception of sensitive documents. But it's a symptom, perhaps, of, a, of an economy that is increasingly seen as being rather creaky, rather old fashioned. And so that's definitely a factor in, in this ongoing discussion about China. Thanks to James. And now to a very special interview with John J. Sullivan, a key witness and actor during the events preceding and following the full scale evasion in February of 2022. Having been nominated in 2019, Mr Sullivan was appointed the United States Ambassador to Russia in 2020, having previously served as the 19th US Deputy Secretary of State from 2017 to 2019, during which time for just under a month in April 2018, following President Trump's dismissal of Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, served as the acting United States Secretary of State. A member of the Republican Party, Sullivan remained ambassador to Russia during the presidential transition of Joe Biden, finally leaving Moscow in September 2022, having been Washington's man in that city during a critical period, one covered in detail in his new book, Midnight in Moscow. We spoke earlier today about the lead up to the invasion, the Russian and US strategies at various critical junctures and the misunderstandings that continue to plague Western approaches to this war. This is our conversation. Thank you very much for your time, Mr. Sullivan. So on October 11th, I think it was, 2019, according to my notes, President Trump nominated you to be the United States ambassador to Russia. Take us back to 2019. Where were we geopolitically in the US's relationship at that point? So 2019, at that point, I'd been the deputy secretary of state for a little over two years. Uh, if we, we focus on October, it was two and a half years at that point. Ukraine was a concern. What had happened in Crimea and the Donbass five years before was a lingering problem, but it was a problem. It wasn't a crisis. It wasn't top of the agenda we in the United States were concerned about, depending on which side of the political aisle uh, one was on, Russian interference in uh, the 2016 and the 2018 midterm elections at that point, or from the, the Trump White House's perspective, uh, the politicization of and what Trump considered, and I think history or recent history at least has shown some of the overblown accusations about Trump's relationship with Putin. So focusing on Russia and Ukraine, as I write in, in my book, my charge from the administration when I got confirmed as ambassador in December of 
2019 was to confront the Russians where uh, where we needed to, but to try to work with them uh, in areas where we were still engaged with them. Strategic security talks, for example, thinking about what would happen to the New START Treaty, which was going to expire in, in early February of 2021. And then the, uh, you know, the geopolitical issues across Europe and, and Central Asia, uh, whether it's Ukraine, Syria, Moldova, Armenia, Georgia, all of which are, are top of mind today were, were important issues in, the, in U.S.-Russia relations and geopolitically. Finally, I'd add concern, uh, not as acute as it is today, a concern about the burgeoning relationship between Moscow and, and Beijing. Interesting. Well, we'll come to that hopefully in a moment. But just staying with that period, at what point after your appointment did it become quite obvious that Ukraine was actually a viable military target from the Russian perspective and indeed an invasion was likely? So I'd separate those two. So target probably from the, the you know my first day in Moscow at the start of 2020. Although if you roll back the clock, there was some in early 2020, Putin replaced his lead uh, negotiator, lead person in the Kremlin in January, February of 2020 with a guy named Dmitry Kozak, who had been with Putin for decades back to St. Petersburg days. But there was some optimism is too strong a word, but some hope that this may have represented a shift in Putin's thinking his willingness to engage with the Ukrainians, which is what we were pushing the Russians to do. And Kozak and Yermak had uh, a number of discussions in the spring. It eventually fizzled. It, it came to nothing. There was a brief ceasefire yet again in, in that period, but it came to nothing. I think that's when late spring of 2020, when Putin's views really hardened on Ukraine, Zelensky, that it was going to require the euphemism the Russians use is military technical means to accomplish his goals in Ukraine. And that just built over the next year and a half. Big troop deployments in the spring of 2021, which caused uh, great concern you know, across the NATO alliance in Washington and in London. I think there may have been there were differing views among uh, intelligence agencies in the West. I, I when I, I was ambassador in Moscow, I, I worked very closely with uh, the UK embassy with Her Majesty's ambassador. There, we had our intelligence professionals sharing information. Uh, the United States perspective was probably not likely that he was going to invade, but there were others who thought differently. Thought there might be a more limited incursion. That's a, that's an expression that Biden used right before the invasion that again caused some some controversy. But it, the thinking was that it, it, the way that they were positioned, that there could be a limited incursion across the, the coastline of the Sea of Azov to create that land border with Crimea, which, which they desired, and potentially going all the way to Odessa. But Biden and Putin then meet in June of, of 2021, June 16th. And as I write in my book, as I look back on it now, I think the most important thing about that meeting was, was uh, what was not discussed, and that was Ukraine. And as I look back on it now, uh, my conclusion is Putin had decided he was going to have to do something with respect to Ukraine to achieve his uh, his goals, de- which ultimately articulated as denazifying and demilitarizing Ukraine. But if you look back at it now, you look back on the press conferences, Putin and Biden gave consecutive press conferences after the summit. I I was there with Biden. And Putin at his press conference, again, the two leaders meet, there's fleeting references to Ukraine, the Minsk agreements, blah, blah, blah. Putin gives a press conference. The first question to Putin from state media is, this is a paraphrase, it was essentially the most important thing to Russians is Ukraine. What did you discuss with Biden about Ukraine? And Putin says, well, the president said Biden wants the Minsk agreements enforced. Uh, he's going to need to talk to his his vassal. He didn't use that word, but they do. 
when speaking publicly now, speak to Zelensky. And that was about it. Biden then gives a press conference after that. He lists, I, I counted it at one point, 11, 12 things. And it was either the 11th or the 12th thing, a sentence fragment that we discussed Ukraine and the Minsk agreements. So over the summer of 21, there are work streams that grow out of the Biden-Putin meeting on strategic stability, what's going to uh, replace New START when the New START treaty expires in 2026, cyber issues. I was responsible for wrongfully detained Americans. That's a whole different line of dialogue. Climate change, Secretary Kerry the president's special representative on climate change came to Moscow in July to talk to Putin's representative within the run up to COP26. So there are all these work streams, dialogues going between the United States and Russia. I came home in late October uh, on leave, late October of 21. And I was at home and I got summoned to a meeting with Secretary Blinken, who then took me into a secure video teleconference with the White House where the U.S. intelligence community briefed on their emerging conclusion that Putin, that that the the military buildup that we'd seen in the spring, the troops hadn't really gone back to their garrisons. They left in place logistics, fuel dumps, ammo dumps, field hospitals. And now there was an even bigger buildup. And this time the conclusion was he was going to invade. Because I was in Washington, I traveled with Ambassador Burns, the CIA director, where we first broached this with with the Russians. Burns sent by Biden, spoke to Putin. We met with Patrashov. He met with Bortnikov, et cetera, to say, we see what we're going to do. Don't do it. You know, there'll be catastrophic sanctions, et cetera. So that's my perception as an ambassador. That's the chronology from, from my perspective. And starting from early November of 2021 until, until February 24th, it was all about deterring, trying to stop an invasion of Ukraine, because what the conclusion was, it wasn't going to be a limited incursion. It was going to be an envelopment as it as it turned out to be. That's a fascinating timeline. Thank you. I just want to stay on this issue. So sanctions were threatened, you say. Was there what else was threatened in those conversations? I mean, what, what were there conversations about the prospect of there being troops on the ground before any invasion to preempt any invasion, whether that be talking to the Russians or, or not? What, what was the what was the state of the conversation between the US and Russia? Yes. And, and indeed, internally as well. So internally, uh, the message which came clear as we got on the verge of the invasion was two instructions from, from Biden to do all we could first to try to dissuade, deter Putin from invading. But second, as we got closer to, to the invasion to do all we could to support Ukraine, but without getting the United States involved in a war with Russia. So there was no threat of U S troops NATO going in to to buck up Ukraine. What we were focused on was Burns's trip to Moscow is, I believe, November 2nd. In mid-December, I was summoned to the foreign ministry and given two draft treaties, which is something that Putin started talking about in November of 21. One treaty draft was between the United States and Russia. The second was between NATO and Russia. It was all about diplomacy and trying to address Putin's security concerns. The discussions focused on Ukraine, but he broadens the aperture to say, you're threatening us, you NATO, the relentless NATO expansion eastward since the end of the Cold War has threatened us. We feel threatened. We need, we Russia need security guarantees. And that was what the discussion was about. And that discussion proceeded then from December into January. In the first 10 days or so of January, there was a U.S.-Russia meeting in the form of the existing uh, strategic security dialogue, but that was all about Ukraine. Then a NATO-Russia council meeting in Brussels through NATO, and then the OSCE met and that, again, was focused on, on Russia. The second two venues were not U.S.-Russia. It was NATO-Russia and uh, in the OSCE, uh, the broader, much broader group. 
both of those fora, it was principally the United States speaking and Russia speaking. As I look back on it now, and even at the time, I remember saying to my colleagues, this is sham diplomacy. What the Russians were doing was they had talking points, which didn't vary from the beginning of November until February 24th, when they were engaging with us. At one point, Lavrov sends Blinken, I think it was signed by, well, it was probably signed by me, but it was on behalf of the United States. We submitted a letter to the MFA responding, we, the United States, responding to their draft treaty. And the draft treaty was was an absurdity. It was, and I describe in the book, there were so many things wrong with it, including the way it was presented to us, an example of why it was sham diplomacy. As I recall, it was a Wednesday. I did not know we were going to be getting a draft treaty. I'm handed the draft. It is only in Russian. It looks you know, pretty slim. It's five or six pages. And I was told that the Russians wanted to negotiate with the United States over the terms of this treaty in 48 hours in Geneva. And if we did not attend, they would make the treaty public and we just have to deal with that publicly then. My, my first reaction, and I said, that, you know, what is the rush? Where is the crisis here? Well, Russia is threatened. But if you think about it procedurally, when the United States, when I as the U.S. ambassador hand a document to the Russian government, to the MFA, I submit it in English, our official language, but I always, without variance, provide a courtesy copy in Russian. And the Russians delight in correcting our Russian, and it, it, that becomes an amusing little sideshow. They handed me a draft treaty in Russian. And I said to them, you, you know, the clock is now ticking. And uh, after the meeting starts, they say 48 hours. So every minute that goes by, it's 47 hours and, uh, and 59 minutes. I said, you know what, just having to get this treaty this draft translated so that the senior leadership in the United States can react to it, form a negotiating committee, come up with a unified position on this draft treaty, travel to Geneva and engage with you in now 47 hours and 45 minutes is preposterous. You can't be serious. Uh, It's Russia's security is threatened. So deal with it. And Subsequent meetings, the the Russian talking points, there were bullet points, and they just read them. I would raise issues on Ukraine, on European security, etc. I would speak as I'm speaking to you today, extemporaneously, informed, obviously, by a huge amount of, of reading and preparation, but trying to engage them in a discussion. And the response inevitably would be from my Russian counterpart, scan down the talking points, find the one that's most relevant or closest to the subject I raise, and rereading it. Sham diplomacy. All for show to say, we tried, we gave the West, we gave the United States a chance to address our security concerns. It wasn't a, wasn't a, uh, a message to us. It was a message to what they call these days the global south to all those countries, not our NATO allies, or not our treaty allies and and partners in the Pacific, South Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, et cetera, but to India, to Brazil, to South Africa, you know, the BRICS, the PRC. But we in the United States, uh, on instructions from President Biden, we're going to try, and not just the United States, France as well, President Macron travels to Moscow to meet with Putin just weeks before the war. We were going to give diplomacy while preparing for and expecting an invasion, give diplomacy every chance until until the war actually started. Thank you for that really, really interesting timeline. You were being played. You knew you were being played by Moscow. Yet clearly the decision already been made by the White House not to do anything that could risk some kind of military confrontation, whether that be having troops on the ground preemptively. Looking back... Do you think that was a mistake? No. No, I mean, at the time, I certainly didn't. I mean, we closed, we shuttered the embassy. We relocated to Lviv. And then eventually, right before the war started, you know, U.S. diplomats and others who were there 
and left for Poland. I remember when Lavrov told Blinken, I'm not sure how many days before the invasion, that, that the Russians had closed their embassy in Kiev. And there was a, there was a funny moment. Uh, I write about this in the book. When I was ambassador, I would get, I wouldn't necessarily be on listening on the call, but I would call in to uh, our operations center and they would read the transcript to me just after the call had happened. And they came to the part where, where uh, Lavrov is telling Blinken that the Russians are, have, have closed their embassy. And he said something to the effect of, yeah, we took all the, you know, the people who don't do any work, who don't contribute to our mission, the women and children, we have removed them first. And of course, our embassy in, in Kiev is headed at the time by a woman. So I just, la- I chuck, I laughed out loud when I heard that. And the woman who was reading it to me, the transcript in the op center, stepped out of character and said, thank you, sir. And then, and then continued with the, uh, the transcript. But right up until the end, they insisted Lavrov, Putin, and the Russians in writing, Lavrov in writing, we will not invade. We have no plans to invade. And so I write, as I write in my book, how anyone could think, why, you know, I think President Macron himself, you talk about being played, Macron comes to Moscow and is lied to his face. And right up until the invasion start, he's still, the weekend before, he's still trying to engage with the Russians. As I write in my book, the, uh, the old Reagan mantra of trust but verify, that's just out the window with this government in Moscow. Now, negotiations, in my opinion, would be a farce. When I say that, people think I'm I'm advocating that we not talk to the Russians. And in fact, I believe we need to talk to the Russians, but we shouldn't, in in using the Western term, negotiate. You say that to one of my colleagues at the State Department, you say it to somebody in the Foreign Office, Foreign Office may be a little more sophisticated, but at the State Department, you know, we start thinking about negotiations and people th- think, you know, how are we going to set it up and good faith gestures. And like this, this, there are no good faith gestures with this, with this government we're, we're dealing with. We need to talk with them and tell them things. And just as importantly, if not more so, listen to what they say, which we're not, not good at. But there's no negotiate. Putin will never compromise on the objectives, as he and Peskov, Lavrov say repeatedly, the objectives of the special military operation are sacrosanct, denazifying Ukraine, removing the Zelensky government, and demilitarizing Ukraine, you know, removing it as a military threat, no, no NATO membership, etc. He, Putin, and more significantly, the Russian government, the Russian nationalists who run Russia today, will never, ever compromise on those objectives. They have a long-term perspective. They may they may agree to a ceasefire, to a pause, but they will never surrender those objectives. I was often asked as ambassador, you know, what are Putin's off-ramps short of that victory, victory on his terms, denazifying and demilitarizing Ukraine. And uh, I joked, I said, there, there are there are no off-ramps. It's like in the United States, there's a famous highway, the New Jersey Turnpike. It's like being on the Jersey Turnpike. There are rest areas, there are, and they're named on the New Jersey Turnpike famously. He'll take a rest area to refit and regroup, but there's no off-ramp. He's on the highway to victory in Kiev. And just over time, if you look at what they're doing, how he has, and we can talk about sanctions and the effect on the Russian economy, he has put the Russian, Russian economy on a war footing. You look at the defense budget that they've recently, they're proposing over the next two, three years. A year ago, year and a half ago, they were talking about defense budgets after they had accomplished their objectives and Ukraine starting to decline. They are on a steep upward trajectory for the next several years. There's no, there's no compromise. There's either surrender by the Ukrainians and their, therefore victory by the Russians, or they'll crush the Ukrainians eventually, and from their view, because of uh, the where, their wherewithal. They're you know, a country of 140 plus million people. 
based on what you've just said, then your former boss, President Trump, is completely wrong in his analysis that this war can be ended satisfactorily in a matter of months if he were re-elected in November. Uh, it depends on what satisfactorily means. It will end satisfactorily from Putin's perspective, which is would be catastrophic for the United States and the West and the world, for that matter. To think think about it, a permanent member of the UN Security Council with the largest stockpile of nuclear weapons in the world, being able to do this to a country that is a, wholly contained within the European continent, the largest country in Europe at the time of the war starting, you know, 40 plus million people, roughly the size of France in population at least, and close in, in geographic size when when the Germans invaded the Low Countries in France in May 1940, he can wage an aggressive war like that on that scale with the result of 15 million people killed, wounded, uh, internally displaced within Ukraine or having to flee their country as refugees. That's, uh, that's pretty catastrophic in, in my view. You alluded to the relationship that's been built as a consequence of this war between Beijing and the Kremlin. How would you summarize that relationship? Was that something that was always at the forefront of the mind of American policymaking during this period, the risk of that? Or is that something that came about later? No, it, I mean, when I was deputy secretary, it was, it was a concern. I mean, even then, in the Trump administration, we were concerned. Well, first with China, if you go back and look at the Trump administration's national security strategy, which was coordinated by the then National Security Advisor, General McMaster, identifies China as, and there are various phrases that U.S. officials use, a generational challenge, the pacing challenge, our principal challenge, and Russia is next in priority. I would phrase it as it's 1A and 1B because, yeah, the Russian economy isn't the economy of the People's Republic of China, and therefore Russia is not as powerful as the Soviet Union was. Interestingly enough, when Burns met with with Patrushev, one of the things Patrushev said was, in talking about economic sanctions, he acknowledged, yeah, we're not not the economic colossus that the Soviet Union was, 15 republics, 350 million people. So acknowledging the fact, as they must, that their their economic heft isn't what it was and is is you know is a fraction small fraction of the chinese economy but they have a heck of a lot more nuclear weapons than the chinese and more than the united states they're threatening to use them uh, at every opportunity there's there's a threat there's nuclear saber rattling from putin on down and they have a large military which they've made clear demonstrated they are not constrained in using it and using it in a brutal way, committing war crimes on a scale, in Europe at least, not seen for for 80 years. I mean, think about this. People just accept as a fact that Prigozhin's allowed to go into the Russian prison system and recruit, quote, volunteers, unquote. It's, It's not a few hundred or a few thousand. This is tens of thousands of Russian prisoners put into a rogue army and sent to a neighboring country to lay waste to that country. What population in any any country is less likely to comply with the law of armed conflict, to not commit war crimes, to not execute civilians or enemy prisoners of war? The prison population, by definition, they don't follow the law, and most of them, many of them, have been committed of brutal crimes of violence. And, and this is organized by the government. Those prisoners, so-called volunteers, who survived six months in the meat grinder, their term, in Ukraine, have a pardon signed by Putin. And oh, by the way, how the Russians treat those prisoners, those volunteers, If they don't comply with all orders, including orders to assault and transpositions that are causing them and their fellow volunteers to be slaughtered, if they don't follow those orders, if they resist, there is military justice in Wagner and its execution. And the execution, when I say brutal, I mean brutal, 
having their heads smashed open with a sledgehammer, which Wagner and the Russians glorify. They put Wagner emblems and hand out sledgehammers like the, the U.S. military does with challenge coins. Talk about brutality. And the world just, eh, it's Russians being Russians. Uh, I, I can't abide it. Jens Stoltenberg recently gave an interview where he said, now that he's out of NATO, what his regrets were. And he said his biggest regret was not arming Ukraine enough preemptively before the invasion and indeed harder and quicker once the full scale invasion began. What are your regrets looking back on that period? Are they the same or are they different? Speaking as a U.S. government official, a former U.S. government official, and I think if you had Biden administration officials uh, out of office would say the same. I, I, I think I would agree with the former Secretary General. We were uh, we were slow before the war. Uh, the Obama administration was slow before the Trump administration. In fact, I had a number of colleagues when I was in the Biden administration who had served in the Obama administration who were saying things like, you know, we screwed up. Biden himself apparently has has said this. I'd seen news reports recently in the U.S., you know, how weak we were in 2014 in responding to what what the Russians have done. But in in the Biden administration, people said, we're not going to make the same mistake again. And we did. Uh, We we delayed in sending necessary uh, military equipment and support. And it was it was noticed in Moscow. Now, the Biden administration, the president's concern, really two principal concerns that a war with Russia starts if the Russians strike a NATO or actually NATO is not sending arms to Russia. Individual NATO countries are. But if a NATO country, Poland, for example, is hit with a Russian strike on areas where that military commitment is being marshaled and turned over to, to the Ukrainians, an attack on Poland a NATO ally under Article 5, you know, the concern is we're now at war with Russia. That's one, probably the more likely to happen. And the second was that the Russians would use, as they threatened, a weapon of of mass destruction, nuclear weapon, chemical weapon. And, And they have used chemical weapons. In fact, the United States again, most recently has accused the Russians of of using banned chemical weapons in Ukraine. So Yeah. I mean, we underestimated, we, the United States, we, the West, not just the United States, no one thought that the Ukrainians were going to be able to resist the way they did. My thinking was we were going to be looking at a situation in which we were supporting Ukrainians who were resisting a Russian occupation, sort of a Soviet style occupation. It was going to be more like Operation Danube, the the Warsaw Pact's invasion of Czechoslovakia in, in 68. And I thought, as I write in my book, I thought Zelensky uh, would be lucky if he survived the way Dubček survived in, in 68. So, you know, we were right about what they were going to do with the Russians. And, you know, my colleagues would often joke, we know more about what the Russians are going to do than what the Ukrainians are going to do. And then over time, after the war started, just being slow in in providing the weapon systems that that the Ukrainians could, as they have now demonstrated, capably and consistent with the law of armed conflict, use to push the Russians when you know when the Russians collapsed in, in and around Kharkiv, recapturing Kherson. That I understand that the new Woodward book that's coming out says this was just as I was leaving as ambassador uh, in September October that the Biden administration was concerned because the Russians really were on their heels then. That was a point where Putin could use uh, nuclear weapons. Even then, I didn't think that that he would. The consequences for Russia would be so significant, including with Putin's dear friend in, in Beijing. You know, my view has been it would take something like, if you look back at the Prigozhin mutiny in June of 2023, if you substitute the Ukrainian armed forces for Wagner, if there's a Ukrainian armored column headed for Moscow that's shooting down Russian helicopters and actually going to threaten Moscow 
you know, then maybe we're, we're looking at a potential use of a nuclear weapon. But short of that, my opinion, easy for me to say, I'm not the president of the United States. I, I find it hard to believe that he'd use, uh, use a nuclear weapon. If you were president of the United States tomorrow, what would you be saying that we need to do at this moment? Not reflecting on the past, but at this moment now. Yeah, the first thing I do as president is shut up. We talk too much about what we're doing, what we're thinking. Shut up. It goes back decades. Describing what prominent Al-Qaeda terrorist has been picked up. Shut up. Let that Al-Qaeda terrorist friend say, hey, have you seen the shake lately? No. Wonder what happened to him. Oh, we just can't help ourselves. Why we publicize our, look, we're, it's, we're, the United States is a democratic republic. We need to be public with what we do. But the first thing I would do as president is shut up and say that we are going to uh, support Ukraine in defending itself against naked aggression, a war crime, committing a crime against peace, an aggressive war. Nazi leaders hanged in 1946 for waging an aggressive war against Poland. That was the lead charge, the crime against peace, the crime against humanity, the genocide of the Holocaust. That was the third crime charged. So, I, you know, I would take this much more seriously. It's a much greater threat to the West than, uh, than our American politicians recognize or at least talk about. I would describe the threat. And I would be less public about, as the Russians are, about what actually we are doing. Thank you. And one final question, because you've been very generous with your time. Is there anything on your mind that when you're discussing this issue is never enough on the mind of the audience you're addressing, whether that be ordinary members of the American public or indeed people who are supposedly following this very closely? You know, even, and I, 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 I say this, I, I spend a lot of time talking, I'm a lifelong Republican, talking to my fellow Republicans who will say in private, yeah, 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 we get it. But I'm getting hammered back home by my constituents. Give me my, you know, three quick talking points when I'm cornered in an elevator with one of my constituents who has heard that Vladimir Putin is just a good Christian nationalist who's doing right by his country. And I just look at them and I say, boy, you sound like anyone who says that sounds like an American firster. And I don't mean this isn't make America great 2016, 2020. This is an America firster in 35, 36, 37, 38 saying, ah, the chancellor's a little rough around the edges. You know, Germany was humiliated coming out of the Great War. He's got to turn Germany around. Yeah, his method, methods are tough. What he's doing to the Jews, that's not right. But he'll ultimately get things sorted out. That type of rationalizing what Putin has done, uh, what Hitler was doing, uh, I mean, it just, the, the echo is, is, in my opinion, is quite loud. And by the way, I'm not sure if you've, you've heard, Francis, you're in London, but there are some here now in the United States who believe that Churchill was, of course, the great villain in the Second World War. I heard that somewhere, some quote historian, unquote, not Hitler, Churchill, the warmonger. Churchill, of course, gives all these speeches in the late 30s that are collected into a book while England slept, published in the United States, Jack Kennedy, President Kennedy as an undergrad, a senior at Harvard, writes his honors thesis, and the title of it is Why England Slept. And the most popular history, at least in the United States, of the attack on Pearl Harbor is At Dawn We Slept. Uh, and, you know, my what I, what I tell people here in the United States is we're asleep right now. Our politicians are asleep. They think it's safe to play politics with what Putin is doing in Ukraine. And we have even uh, broadened the aperture to talk about the Middle East, the South China Sea. This is no time for playing politics. It is as dangerous a time for the United States as, as I've seen in my lifetime, at least my professional career. Well, thank you very, very much for your time. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Oh, thank you, Francis. Grateful for the opportunity to chat with you. <laughs>
But James, thank you very much for your time today. Where do you want to leave us with in terms of final thoughts? I'll give a final thought on this media report in the FT, uh, which may well be accurate, but as you say, Francis was denied by Ukraine at the time about this question of ceding territory in return for NATO membership. I, I think this is behind closed doors and in the open, just such a contentious issue for the Ukrainians. If you put yourself in their mindset, you know, they've been illegally invaded, they've lost territory to Russia. And yes, joining NATO would give them a very significant security guarantee in the context of future aggression by Russia. It's such a painful prospect, the idea that you've got to give up territory that's been illegally invaded. It would be perhaps almost impossible for any country to swallow. This is obviously a unique situation, the war between Russia and Ukraine, but it's, it's very difficult. It's very painful. And I think there's an open question here, which is, you know, even NATO membership, is that enough to give Ukraine the security guarantees that it both needs and deserves in terms of reassurance that it wouldn't be invaded again? And if it were invaded, would that definitively mean the triggering of Article 5 and other NATO allies coming to support them. One inevitably hopes in this hypothetical situation where Ukraine might join NATO that they would have full guarantees about this. But of course, Ukraine joining NATO would be a major test, perhaps the ultimate test of NATO unity. Uh, and I think that's a discussion that we're going to see unfolding publicly, potentially in the weeks and months to come. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph, created by David Knowles. To support our work and to stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, please subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk slash Ukraine The Latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our foreign affairs newsletter, bringing stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine Live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. We also do the same for other breaking international stories. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so that you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do please refer to podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app and leave us a review as it helps others find the show. Please also share it with those who may not be aware we exist. As the disinformation war continues, we're relying on your support more than ever. You can get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do continue to read every message. You can also contact us directly on Twitter, now X. You can find our handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we're especially interested to hear where you're listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was today produced by Phil Atkins. Executive producers are Louisa Wells and David Knowles. <laughs>